Okay. So as I mentioned, we're going to be talking today about that whole idea of December job search. And before we do, I want to do a little bit of a cracked crystal wall approach. We're seeing some things happening in the job market right now that y'all should be aware of. You probably already are. We're starting to see more layoffs again, and which is, I will tell you, is unusual for December. Normally, those layoffs will take place earlier in the year, November. Um, you may see some the very first week in December, but then usually layoffs lay off, okay, until after the first of the year. But we're seeing companies do this more as a way of right-sizing again. They're trying to figure out where they need to be. Now, some of what they're doing now is more to please the stockholders than anything else. So they're doing it as a way of reducing their headcount to make themselves look better. But when they do that, bad thing for the employees who are being laid off, good thing for you. Because that, what that means is if they're doing it just for that reason, they're doing it without regard to what jobs really need to remain. They're not really doing a whole lot of thinking behind the process which means that come the end of December, beginning of January, they're going to start posting the jobs that they laid off by mistake. It's their way of reorganizing. Hopefully they'll do that before layoff, but oftentimes we find they do that afterwards as well. So you're gonna see some more of those jobs coming up. But from everything I'm reading from the Bureau of Labor Statistics and some friends that I have who are labor economists, they're telling me that the beginning of January may not be a great start to the hiring process. That there may be fewer jobs as companies trying to just figure out where they really need to be and they see where the economy is going. All of that feeds into the idea that yes, there's still gonna be jobs and the jobs that are posted are really gonna be good jobs. The jobs that are posted right now are the jobs that people really want to fill. And we're gonna talk more about that in a moment. But it's one of the reasons that starting or continuing your job search now is a really good thing. Okay. So I'd like to start, though, by asking if anybody has had any successes over the last couple of weeks that you'd like to share with us. Okay. I can start. Perfect. Hi, everyone, for who don't know me regularly on our regulars, um, Michelle Caldelori, and I'll be putting my information in the chat shortly. Um, success is, I consider it a success is a still in progress. Um, about, I'd say, four weeks ago, I started interviewing um, for a VP position um, for a company um, that's right up my alley. Um, I'm sorry for the background noise. Uh, I have a little puppy. We don't hear it. It's okay. <laughs> and uh it's been going well i'm on my now fourth round i mean that's the tedious part but uh and hopefully these will be the last rounds um so these are all c-level discussions and i um, excited that they're still proceeding and i'm still in the game um so it's a success absolutely it's a success congratulations thank you okay frank Good morning. I got an uh, interview in a couple of hours, second interview for a contract role, a uh, six-month contract uh, helping um, PWC. So that'll be interesting if it comes to fruition. Doing what, Brian? Uh, heading, <clears throat> helping them brand their educational corporate university, I guess is what the, the contract says. I'm trying to understand nice. it, actually. Yeah, it'll be fun. Okay. Congratulations. I saw somebody else's hand. Al, you had your hand up. Yeah, I have an interview coming up uh, next Friday for at a community college where I've been. Uh, I applied for a few different positions, so um, so looking at that, um, hopefully this is the third time to charm. So we'll see what happens with that. Congratulations. Okay, so as you can hear, interviews are still happening. You may see fewer of them, but those that are taking place now are for jobs that companies really want to fill. And that's one of the hidden secrets of the job market. A lot of people think that come November, December, you should stop applying. And it's actually exactly the opposite. If a company is posting a job now, 
they're posting it because they really, really want to fill it. And they'd love to have somebody in place <clears throat> shortly after the start of the year. Okay. <coughs> and what we're finding is, and this has gone on for years, <coughs> is you all know, the, any of you who's ever been invol involved in any kind of a budgeting process, you know that budgets for companies that are on a calendar year basis, if the money isn't used by the end of the year, it may not be renewed, right? So you see, bless you. So you see that one of the things that's going to happen is if for some companies that are in that kind of a situation, there's going to be a very large hiring push. Companies are going to make a big deal about making sure that they are actively recruiting and talking with candidates to fill those positions. Now, from the corporate side of things, even if I haven't actually filled a position, if I am actively recruiting and I can demonstrate that, that money isn't going to go away. It will remain in my budget for next year. But if I haven't done anything, if the job is just posted and it's languishing, it's not sit it's just sitting there, then I may lose that funding. And that funding may not come back. I have to work harder to justify it for the coming year. So from that corporate funding standpoint, doesn't work the same way, unfortunately, the college level, Al. Um, but from that corporate funding standpoint, when a company is on that calendar year basis for their fiscal year, if money isn't spent by the end of December or isn't actively in the process of being spent, you may lose it. From that corporate standpoint, the same is true in terms of headcount. Headcount decisions are made as part of that budgeting process. And while headcounts are normally set prior to the end of December, they're still in flux which means that if you've got that open headcount and you haven't filled that spot or actively working for it, in addition to losing the budget, you may lose the headcount. So there really is this big push. I know it doesn't seem like it, but there is a big push to get hiring done or hiring activity done during the month of December. Okay. Any of you ever been in a situation where you were actually interviewed in December or hired in December and hired in January. Okay. I actually started one job the week before Christmas. Okay. And actually, as I'm thinking about it, it was actually Christmas week. So I was there for two days and then we were off. <laughs> okay. But one of the best jobs I had, the, idea is that companies are really actively pushing to get it done. So it's a really important time frame to be looking. You'll also start to see, you're seeing people saying now that they've been hired. That may slow down a little bit during December, all those posts, but starting in January, you're going to see a surge. People who are going through this employment process now who actually get their offers and start at the beginning of January. Okay. So what kinds of questions do you all have about doing a job search during January, during December and why that's important? Are there special things you should be looking for? By the way, thanks to all of you who are putting them in there. Yes, Al. I had a question about LinkedIn. Yes. This came up yesterday. Um, it looks like they're limiting the personal note to 10 when you request a connection with someone. Is that is that everybody, everybody seeing that same thing? Uh, I've heard that it may actually be 25 a month. Mm -hmm. Sue, have you seen anything different? It's something that we fought against. LinkedIn announced it a month or so ago. Uh, a number of us pushed back against it and they pulled it back. Okay, at that point, it was 10 a month. I think they have reinstituted that again, uh, that it would be personal invitations with a note um, for 25 a month is where I thought I saw it last, but I will double check that out. Yeah, this was last night. I was trying to, I was on a call, a different call and try to connect with someone says you've reached your limit of 10 um, for the per month. So I don't know if they may they keep changing it, maybe, I don't know. So 
Okay. Well, I think there are a number of us who are still pushing back against that. If you have a paid account, it doesn't ha doesn't apply to you. Right. Right. But most of us, me included, have a free account. Okay. So that could be an issue. So Al, I will double check it. I will put it in our LinkedIn private group, whether or not it, they finally decided on 10 or 15 or 25. But here's the deal. I would love for you all to connect with one another. If you are part of that lunch and learn with Linda group, all you have to do, you don't have to, since it's a private group, you're just connecting with other people in that group. You don't necessarily need an invitation or a message. Okay. If you are not connected with me, though, please do. I can't invite you to that private group unless we're first level connections. You can ask to join, but I can't invite you. Okay. And I've put the link to that private group there. Okay. So, Frank, you're saying that. LinkedIn learning alone is worth the cost of the paid membership? Yeah, in my opinion, I think it's it's the amount of courses that they have and the how often they're refreshed is, is great. I probably take a course a, a month. I try not to publish them all because my LinkedIn thing gets really nuts. You know, you can also take some out and put add new ones in. Yeah, good point. Yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> Too much work. I, I understand. So Frank makes a good point. If you're using the LinkedIn learning, okay, and taking advantage of that, that paid subscription may be worth it. But that paid subscription now is what, $40 a month, Frank? I'm trying to remember. 29 is what I think it, it is. I think they've raised it to 30 They've raised it? Okay. At least last time I looked. Um, I may be wrong, and we'll double check that to make sure. But that's a reasonable amount of money, okay? LinkedIn has some great options if you are using that paid account, one of which is that you don't have that limitation on the number of personalized connection requests that you can send. You also have the advantage of LinkedIn learning. And if you are actually taking advantage of that on a monthly basis, that may make some sense. The other advantage of that LinkedIn paid account is that you can send messages to people who are not your first level connections. Okay. But again, you have to send a specialized in message and you have a limited number of those. In terms of the LinkedIn learning, there is another option if you choose not to do a paid account. And I know we're getting off topic for a moment, but it's important. Check with your local public library. Many libraries offer LinkedIn learning to their patrons who have a library card with them. That doesn't mean that you've got an affiliate card, right? You've belonged to one library system. That's where you're paying taxes, but you can get a library card in another one. If you are actually paying taxes in that library district and they are offering LinkedIn learning, you can use LinkedIn learning free through them. So double check with your local public library. Okay, that is another way to get around that. The other thing is that depending upon, sorry, LinkedIn, I hope you're not listening, but if you are looking for just that training aspect, LinkedIn learning is one way of doing it, but there's also an option called Coursera. Coursera offers a number of courses. Most of those courses are put together by major universities or by large companies. For that same $40 a month, you can get a Coursera membership, okay? Right now they're offering, I think it's still in place, first month for a dollar, and then you can go after that. You can pay on a monthly basis. You can get a yearly subscription, which is $400. You can take almost any course that they offer, they offer a, a number of certifications as well. Certifications will be an extra co uh, cost. But in some cases, just taking the classwork and adding that classwork to your resume shows that you're really doing it and you don't necessarily have to have the certification yet. 
Yes, Michelle. Um, I also wanted to add that uh, another similar one like Coursera um, is uh, Pluralsight. Um, and they were just having some um, Black Friday, Cyber Monday sales, and they still may be. Um, so you might want to check them out. Um, they are heavy on technology, so I don't know um, if there's any other technologists. But they also have some business courses, too. What was the name of that, Michelle? Could you put it in the chat? Sure, can. Because that's not one that I've heard of. Oh, okay. In one second. Absolutely. So there are a variety of different options there that really make it useful. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Um, on the topic of Coursera, they actually offer bachelor and even master's degrees programs there. I don't know whether you mentioned that I was having a feline feline uh, interruptions here. You're absolutely right. They do. Now, that's not going to be part of that $40 a month. Yeah, that's that's correct. It 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 then funnels through the university. You're just using right. uh, Coursera as your uh, user interface. That's exactly right. The Coursera platform is very easy to use. Lots of different options, including lots of free options. Okay, so go in and check to see what you want to do. Um, it is again for the most part online self-directed learning. Some of those courses will actually have work that you do back and forth, and you get feedback. But I think it's a great platform if it's something that you want to do. So trying to expand your options. But LinkedIn as a paid service has some options that you may want to consider. Now, if you are a veteran, you get one year of paid membership in LinkedIn Learning or in LinkedIn for no cost. Okay. If that's something that you're interested in, let me know and I will get you some additional information. And I just checked on Pluralsight, uh, Linda. They yeah. are still having their Cyber Monday deal for individual plans, 50% off. So that's a good deal. Absolutely. So go check out some of those resources. In fact, we're going to be talking about some of those resources when we talk about, you know, your to-do list later in December. But absolutely, trying to get some of those skills in place, great idea. Okay. All right. So back to the idea of looking for jobs in December. So you know that a lot of people, lots of us, right? Lots of family stuff going on, lots of friends stuff going on. Sometimes it feels like job search is a waste of time in December. I'm here to tell you it's not. As a recruiter, as a headhunter, as a hiring manager, I know that there are positions that I need to fill and I need to fill them fast. And recruiters don't take that time away. They don't stop looking to fill those jobs in December. So here are a couple of things that you really should be aware of. Normally, I'm going to tell you that if the job has been posted, you want to apply immediately. And that's still true. You want to apply as quickly as you can, but you want to do it in a very targeted way. But especially during the month of December, Take a look at some of those older job postings. If a job has been up for three or four weeks, or you're now seeing it reposted again, what that means is this is a job the recruiter really needs to fill, and they haven't found the right candidate yet. So taking a look at some of those older jobs is a way of saying, gee, I'm going to target this one because I know they're still actively looking. Yes, Michelle. Just a question on that. Do you have any insight? Because um, I've heard this before in regards to companies just posting for the sake of posting um, and demonstrating, you know, their hiring. Yep. Um, when the role really isn't available. Um, so can you shed any light on that? I wish I could tell you it didn't happen, Michelle, but it does. Yeah. And you find it happening often, unfortunately, at the end of a quarter. Mm. OK, when stockholders are really looking to see what's going on, companies do that. It's a ghost post. Right. OK, it's done to show the stockholders that they are growing. So the, unfortunately, there isn't a whole lot of way that you can tell whether or not those jobs are real, except. Go to the company website. And see whether or not that job is posted there. See how active they are there, okay? 
Are you going to guarantee that it's real? No, but let's say that you see 20 jobs with the same title by the same company. In all likelihood, that's a ghost job. Because mm. I, I get, I wonder on the reposting, whether that's part of the reason they're reposting. Um, but I also see, um, and I and I'm, I was thinking this was the case that if a job was remote, uh, they seem to post it in different locations. So, so it kind of looks like there's multiples of the same. Yeah, you have to be careful about that. Mm -hmm. So one, some of those are legitimate, some of the, most of those are not. So if they're posting it and saying it's the same job in Kalamazoo and in Kansas City and in Santa Barbara and in wherever, check to see whether or not they actually have a physical location in those spots. Mm. If a company actually has a physical presence in each of those cities, it may very well be a real job. If not, they're just trying to broaden that appeal and show that they have 10 jobs open when they really may not have any. Now, one reason that remote jobs do list a location, even though they say remote, back to that idea of business finance. If a company has a physical presence or has more than one employee that they are paying in that state, then they have to pay certain business taxes in that state. So even though a company says it is remote anywhere, okay, if they're saying remote anywhere, they're willing to pay business taxes anywhere. If they're saying it is remote, but it is remote California, Maryland, San, um, Texas, it means that you can be anywhere within those states because they're already paying business taxes in those states. The business taxes are generated, the, or the need to pay those business-related taxes are generated when they pay somebody in that state. Okay, which is one of the things that some companies found out the hard way when all this remote work started going into place. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, and by the way, remote jobs are still available. They're still growing. In fact, of the people that I know who have gotten offers recently, two of the offers were for in-person full-time. The rest were either hybrid or fully remote. So the offers are still there. You just have to search harder. And because so many people are looking for those jobs, they may look like they're harder to find. So when you're looking for a job in December or any time, but especially December, we're finding you have a specific advantage that a lot of people don't because so many people are choosing to take the time off. There truly are fewer people applying for those same jobs. Fewer people means better chance that your resume is actually going to get seen and looked at. It also means that there's, even more emphasis on making sure that you are a direct fit. Recruiters are incredibly busy this time of year and may not sound like it, but they are. They're under the gun to get a number of these positions moving. The easier you make it for them to see that you're somebody they want to talk with, more likely they are to reach out. So truly don't skimp on the customization for the resume and for that cover letter, really, truly important. But it's a great time to look and to make yourself stand out for those particular roles. Okay. So where do you find some of these jobs and what else are we seeing? Take a look at the jobs, as I mentioned, that are being posted right now. If they're posted at any time in the month of December, they really want to fill them. Michelle, for your point about the, the ghost jobs, those are more likely the last two weeks of December than they are the beginning of December.
And I think it's a bad practice, but we know the companies do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. But the idea of that job being reposted is often an indication that they haven't found who they're looking for. So keep at it, keep looking for those jobs. The other thing that you should know is that there are some additional ways that you can find how some of those companies are gonna be looking and getting yourself set up, maybe not for a job right now, but for a job at the beginning of the year. One of the things, Cracked Crystal Ball, is it, who told me that they were interviewing for Frank, said he, you were interviewing for a contract job, right? He's letting the oh. dog out. Ah, never mind. <laughs> oh, thank you. I'm not reading the... Uh... That's okay. <laughs> yep. Okay. But contract jobs are going to become more plentiful again. And we often see contract jobs coming up in December and January and February. The reason for that, remember I mentioned that companies are doing these right-sizing, these reevaluating what those jobs look like and what they need. As they do that, they will often start putting together positions that are for those contract kind of roles while they determine that this is really where they need to be. Taking a contract job, I know it sounds scary, but a contract job is actually a really good thing in many cases. It helps you get your foot in the door, it helps you get some cash coming in, always a good thing. Some of those contract jobs will turn into permanent jobs or as permanent as they ever are these days. But it gives you a chance not only to get that cash coming in and to get that going, but it, a contract job gives you a chance to practice a new skill, to get experience in that new skill. If you haven't done something like that in a while, it gives you current experience to put on your resume. It also gives you a current recommendation. Somebody who knows what you're doing now. The other thing that people don't often don't tell you about contract jobs is that when you're applying for a contract job and then you find something else within the company, you have those internal references, those internal connections to help push you forward. That gives you a leg up on anyone coming in from the outside. So while contract jobs may sound very scary, there's some very good reasons for trying to apply for those. Frank, sorry about that. I didn't realize as I started talking about that that you were out walking the dog, but we were talking about the benefits of doing of applying for a contract job. Oh, darn, and I missed it. I'm sorry. <laughs> Shame on me. I, I, you don't need to repeat it, but I, I appreciate that. Darn it. It's okay. It will be in the playback. But the idea is that a contract job, Frank, gives you a leg up. It gives you those internal references. It gives you those internal connections. It gives you a chance to practice and get experience in a new area and to highlight that on your resume. Okay, and your LinkedIn profile. So there are, are a lot of advantages. And I know that they're scary because normally a contract job does not provide benefits. Now, I know it's another deviation, but I wanted to make this one clear too. There are some contract jobs actually that will provide benefits. It depends on how the organization structures it. So if the organization is hiring the contractors under their own name, okay, you won't get benefits. But sometimes what a contract job will do or a company will do is that they will in effect outsource that contract to a, an outside firm. Okay, Robert Half is one that comes to mind. So if you are working as a contractor for company A, on your resume, you say that's where you're working. You're doing the work for that company. Your paycheck, however, may come from Robert Half. It's just that outside outsourced area. Robert Half is not your employer, the company is. The advantage when a company does that, when they go through that outside source, is that that outside source may offer you the option for benefits. It's one of the things that has grown often over the last several years. Yes, Frank. Uh, I'm in that latter category. It would be a contractor 
that would employ me and I think they would offer me benefits, although I'm not too worried about the benefits because my wife has really nice benefits at her work. So what I am interested in is it's a six month contract and knowing how long it takes to find a job. I mean, I feel like it would be OK, I'm going to take if, if I get this job, I'm going to take it. And what, two months later, I start applying again. Is that the way it would work? Do you think? Yes, it is. Wow. Sorry. So recruiters understand that if it's a contract position, you're under no obligation to stay and they're under no obligation to keep. Even though it says it's a six month contract, Frank, the company can terminate that at any time. So the same way that it is employment at will for most jobs, it is employment at will from a contract position. Knowing that, Companies don't necessarily like it, but they understand that while you're in that contract role, because you know it is a finite time frame, that your first priority is you, and therefore continuing to look and leaving even before the contract is over is not unusual. So mm -hmm. I highly recommend, actually, Frank, that if you take a contract role, you start looking imme almost immediately. Okay. <clears throat> thanks like this is one of those like yeah okay i've never i mean i've never worked contract so it's going to be weird working contract in terms of the actual work is really the same as doing the work it's really a matter of where the paycheck comes from and whether or not you are considered an employee or a contractor or a, um, a service now one of the reasons companies are going to be going more toward those contractors goes back, Michelle, to that idea of doing it for the stockholders. From a budgetary standpoint, employees are considered overhead. Stockholders want overhead to be reduced. They want headcount to be reduced. Contractors count as expenses. It's an entirely different bucket in that budget pool. Because they're considered to be expenses, they also don't count against the headcount that stockholders are looking at. Is it a fudge? Absolutely. Does it help a company get the work done? Absolutely. Okay. But because you are a contractor, it even though they are paying perhaps an outside source to co help cover some of those expenses, over and above what they pay you, they aren't paying you benefits. So that also reduces their cost to some extent. So there are lots of different reasons that they do it. I truly believe that we're going to see more of those contract positions again. Okay, we're seeing a lot of them now. I predict that we will see even more of them. Okay, as the new year starts and throughout December, January, February. Companies are going to be doing more of that right-sizing and trying to figure out where things need to be. And one of the things that companies have started to remember is that hiring somebody for a contract means that I have a project that I need work done on. And when that project is finished, I can say adios and there's no penalty. I don't have to make work for somebody else to do. Now that said, Frank, I have seen some people working for the same company in contract roles that keep getting renewed and renewed and renewed. Okay. I have one woman that I've worked with who has been a contractor with the same company for over six years. Now, because of the way contracts work, okay, you may be asked to take a one month break in between a contract because you can only work X number of months on an uninterrupted basis. Or if they continue to renew it and you work more than, I think it's 1,040 continuous hours, they must offer you the option of some sort of participation in their retirement, okay? You put the money in, they don't necessarily have to match, depending upon how their plan is structured. So not an accountant, okay, not a, an employment lawyer, but it is definitely something to take a look at. Okay. 
The other way that companies get around that, Frank, is by taking that contract and renewing it, but renewing it with a slightly different title. So it counts as if it's a brand new contract. I know. Look, you're not their primary focus. Theirs is their bottom line and getting the work done. But that said, there are lots of ways that you can use some of that to your advantage, recognizing that it's out there. So if you're willing to take a contract role, now's a great time to do it. The other thing that we've discovered is that, especially during December and January, a lot of people are very hesitant to take those contract roles. It's not a real job. Sure it is. But because of that, we're finding that we know the companies are looking for more contractors. There are fewer people applying for those jobs. Again, you have a better shot because you have less competition. Contract roles often don't necessarily go through the same lengthy um, interview process. So Michelle, you said you were on your third or fourth round for your job? Yes. Okay. For a contract role, you may only go through one or two. So that hiring process seems to take place faster. So definitely take a look at some of those contract roles. So reasons to continue to look during December. Companies really, truly want to hire. Even if they aren't filling the role now, they want to make sure that they're getting whatever they can do to get themselves set up for January. Fewer people are applying, which means you have less competition. But because recruiters are swamped, you truly have to make sure that you are highlighting what you can do for that particular job. It's always important, but now it becomes even more so. Okay, I shouldn't say even more so. It becomes really important to do it now too. I have less time as a recruiter. I'm working on lots. If you are applying for a job in December and you get a call from a recruiter saying, do you have time to set up an appointment? Your flexibility during the month of December is crucial. I know you have a lot of things going on, but the more flexible you can be in terms of your timing, the higher you'll go up in that recruiter's estimation. Because they are trying to fill so many different positions, because they have so many balls that they're juggling toward the end of the year, and also in the month of January, your flexibility makes them feel good about you and about your position, your view for the company. So if you have to juggle a couple of balls, it's not a bad thing to be able to do. Now, December and January, there are some tricks to starting to look for some of those jobs as well. So you know that if you keep high, keep looking December and January, be more selective. You don't have to do this as a spray and play. Please don't, okay? December, you've got limited time. You're doing a lot of different things. With fewer people applying for the same jobs, be selective. Make sure that you're applying for the jobs you really want that you really know that you can do. Again, with that minimum 70% match between what the job is looking for and what you can bring. And then highlight that in your materials. So less competition, but because the recruiters are busy, you need to really make sure that you're catching their attention. But the other thing is that because you're being selective, you're getting yourself into that mindset of you hiring them as much as they're hiring you. The thing with being selective, especially during December, take your time, okay? Make sure you are carving out time for family and friends as well, but keep that job search going. You wanna set yourself up for success in December, January, and February, and now's the time frame to do that. I mentioned earlier that you're gonna see fewer people or may see fewer people announcing their jobs. Hey, I just got hired, right? You'll see the surge of those again in January. Take advantage of all of those notifications that you see 
where somebody got a job in either the company that you're interested in or in the field that you're interested in. If they got a job, number one, it means that company is hiring. If they got a job, take a look to see where they left. Because that means that there's probably an opening where they were from. That's part of that stealth job search. Okay. That job may not even be posted yet. But you know now that you can keep an eye out for it. And by congratulating the person who took the job, right? Connect with them. Take a look at their profile. See where they came from. Check out what other openings are there. Check their company's webpage both the company that they're going to and the, as well as the company they left. Check out their page on LinkedIn. See what openings they have. And start positioning yourself to move in those directions. You don't have to wait for the job to be posted in order to do that. So if it's a company you're really interested in, start commenting on their posts. If you're congratulating somebody who's left a job, not only congratulate with them, but reach out and network with them. You know, that sounds like a great move for you. Tell me, what did you do to prep yourself for that? It looks like it was a great idea. Would you be willing to talk to me a little bit about not only what you did to get there, but company you left sounds like a good one too. Can you give me some information? Build on those relationships. That's that hidden job market that people are talking about. But here's one way to think about it and one way to try and find it. So take a look at all of those announcements. Okay. Commenting on them does more than just congratulate that other person. It also helps you. So that's another. How many of you are going to a holiday party? Of any kind? Virtual, in person, friends and family. December is a great time to do some of that informal networking as well. And that's also part of your job search. So think about what you're going to tell people when you meet them or when you talk with them. Do you have your quick little elevator pitch? You should put together an elevator pitch for networking in these informal parties, these informal gatherings. So if somebody asks you, what are you doing these days? Well, I'm looking for a job. I'm excited because I'm looking for, right? How many of us do that, right? I don't have anything yet. I'm still looking. It's, eh, I don't know what I'm going to do. As opposed to, I'm excited because I'm exploring new opportunities here. Here's the kind of thing I'm looking for. Do you have anybody I can talk to? Who, what do you ideas do you have for me? Right? In that positive vein is so much better than, oh, I'm looking for a job. Who we are, what we do becomes so much of who we are that it's hard not to get that down mindset and to project it. But if you do it from that positive standpoint, people are more likely not only to talk with you, but to continue the conversations and think about it and maybe come up with an idea of somebody else you might be able to talk with. You never know where those networking opportunities are going to come from. And we all have so many people in our network that we don't think about. And December, people are getting together all the time, virtually in person, running into people in the grocery store the, as you're out shopping. Don't be afraid to strike up some of those conversations. A friend of mine was unemployed. He's a CFO type person. <laughs> and Holiday season, he decided he really needed to find that temporary job. He needed to get out of the house, if nothing else. 
he took a job at our at the Target in our neighborhood. Okay, temporary jobs right now, by the way, are out there. People are still hiring. Seasonal jobs are there. So he decided he was going to do that. And it, for him, it turned into more than just a seasonal job. But he was at the cashier station. He was actually checking people out in line. And his wife had said, you know, sure you don't want to do this in an area where people don't know you. And he said, why? I'm not ashamed. It's okay. This is honest work. And I'm looking for a job. It's okay to be doing something else in the meantime. Somebody came through his line that he knew was, wait a minute, what are you doing here? He said, well, you know, I'm, I'm working here now. I'm looking for something new. Didn't you used to be? Right? Yeah. Hmm. Do you have experience doing this? Yeah. I have somebody that I'd like you to talk with or that you might want to talk with, right? Casual conversation ended up with him getting a new job. From not being afraid to be standing at a cashier's station at the Target in our neighborhood. You don't know where those networking conversations are going to come from. And I will tell you that they are more plentiful. People are more open to them during the holiday season because people are reaching out to people they don't remember. So looking for that temporary job in addition to the contract job, in addition to the next forever job, always a good idea. And December is a great idea, great time to do all of it. One other area that you might want to consider when you're talking about looking in December is that We've talked about the fact that sometimes networking is a good thing and it will help you get a job. How many of you have more than 100 connections on LinkedIn? Okay. How many of you have more than 200 connections? 500. My goal is for you all to have at least 500, right? How long has it been since you've reached out to some of those connections? Connections are wonderful, but they're only numbers unless you do something with them. The holidays, the month of December and January are great times to message some of your connections. Now you have to do them individually. You don't wanna do this as a group. You know, it's been a while since we've spoken. I just wanna check in with you. How are things going? Wish you a happy holiday. Would you be open to a 10 minute virtual coffee this just to catch up or would you like to meet for coffee okay catching up with those people does several things number one is it warms up your network but it gives you that opportunity again to say hey how are things going for you always them first and then as part of the end of that conversation by the way i'm looking have you is there somebody that, you know, if you ever hear about something in this area, somebody you think I should talk with? But always about them first. Never reach out to a connection first and say, by the way, I'm looking. You don't want to just pitch them. You want to make it a real connection. And reaching out during the holidays is a great way of doing it. So one of the things that I recommend is if you're going to do that, Play with your message, okay? You can come up with several that you can work. And if you are sending them to your own connections, there are no limits on the number of those you can send. All right, especially because you're doing it individually. Whether you've got a free account or a paid account, you can message your own connections. So be selective, go through your connections list and see who you want to connect with, who you want to follow up with. Make sure you're not sending out too many messages at once so that when people respond, you actually have an opportunity to get back to them because that's really important. 
But if you send out 10 messages a day, that's 50 people you've connected with. And if you can have conversations with some of them, even if it's 10 or 15 minutes, you never know where that's going to go. And if nothing else, it makes you feel good to reconnect with someone. Or to connect if all it is is a paper connection. Find out more about them and what's going on for them. Always ask how you can help them. What's going on for them before you ask about you. Yes, Carol. Hey, I'm having trouble with my video today. Sorry. Um, okay. I, as from a communication standpoint, and that's kind of my, my background, I struggle with I, I uh, just reaching out like if you're reconnecting with someone that you haven't um, spoken to for a while because you know that you do have like a back ask so to me I would prefer to be more transparent not not in a pitchy salesy sort of way but just let them know um hey we haven't talked in a while and I'm also in transition if you have 10 or 15 minutes would love to check check in with you and see, you know, see how things are going after you do like a greeting, you know, a holiday greeting or whatever else. But I feel like you need to put that on the table because you know that you have that behind, <laughs> the ask behind. So I, I don't know what you think about that, but that that's kind of how I would approach it. You have to do what feels comfortable for you, Carol. And some people are okay. absolutely comfortable with that. Um, other people are more comfortable just not even mentioning the ask in that conversation, mm -hmm. and maybe not even in the initial conversation in that first 10 to 15 minutes, and a follow-up. In all likelihood, if this is a connection, and especially if you have that green banner around your face, they're gonna check out your profile, okay? Right. Before they yeah. respond. So they're gonna know you're looking. Yeah. But depends on, depending upon your own comfort level, and think about how you would rather be approached do you want to be approached as an ask or do you want to be approached as a connection yeah and, right yeah so it's that old uh, okay what popped into my head sorry about this um golden rule is Many people think it says do unto others as you would have them do unto you. From a Jewish standpoint, we turn it around. Do not do unto others as you would not have them do unto you. In other words, you put them first. If you don't yeah, want to- Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that, yeah. Okay. So think about it from their standpoint. All of our job search, all of our materials, everything we do has to be done with their perspective in mind, not just us. So however you are comfortable doing it, Carol, you want to be more transparent about it, absolutely do that. <clears throat> Some people are more transparent about that in the actual conversation than they are in the reach out for the conversation. Some people wait yeah. for the second conversation. But it's yeah, yeah. I've done it that way too, just kind of a light, a light touch hello and then and then talk about it when you when you are talking. Right. Yeah. So it's strictly up to your comfort level and what do you think the other person would be most likely to, to be interested in. But it's a great opportunity. You've got a built-in opportunity, a built-in reason for reaching out to people. So if you can commit to reaching out even to five people a week, get yourself in that habit of doing that, it will get you started. In fact, I'd like to ask next week, for those of you who are going to be joining us next week, okay, make it our own little accountability group. Want to see how many of you actually did it. So if you're willing to commit to it, okay, five people, all I'm suggesting, that's one a day. You can 
Write your little message, put it in a Word doc and copy and paste. Okay, do what feels comfortable. It will not count against your message count in a free account because you're not doing this to make a connection. You already have the connection. But see where that might go. Okay. Nice, easy way of making those, those moves to help you move forward. But that also means that you have to be able to start thinking again about your pitch. What is it you want to say and how do you want to say it? And when you're reaching out to somebody and you're saying, can you help me? Remember, be sincere. Think about how you might be able to, if you're asking them for something, what you can do for them, okay? How you can assist them too. Not necessarily because they're in job search. They may be doing other things, but just having that connection first and then moving forward, okay? So I'm going to put... Okay, so here's the link to that private group again. Carol, that's a great idea. So Carol, you said, Carol just downloaded her connection archive to start being able to search it better. Carol, can you talk about that real quick, about how you did that? Sure, I just um, I just went into LinkedIn. Um, I think I had to go to my data settings and privacy, and then um, you can download lots of different types of data. So I just downloaded my connections and then, um, yeah. And then I, I, it was, you get a CSV file. LinkedIn will tell you when it's ready. Right. And then, um, and then I haven't, I haven't started using it yet because it just happened yesterday. Mm -hmm. So I just put it into an Excel file and, and I'm good to go to start searching by companies and roles and things like that. Perfect. That's a great way to do things. By the way, here's one more trick or one more tip for when you're reaching out to people in terms of these messages. I think I mentioned that you can send a video message to a connection. Not a, not a video message, an audio message. Video, you have to go through more steps, but you can send an audio message to a connection. You have to do it from your LinkedIn mobile app. You're going into messaging. You're gonna pick the person's name that you want to send. And then on the bottom, of your screen, a little microphone should pop up. You can send a message, record your voice and send it. And I think it is less than 60 seconds. So it's short. Play with it with some of us in the group first, if you want to, to try it. But that makes you stand out because most people don't do that. It's also your way of saying you went that added mile, that added step, because you can't copy and paste that. You have to do it individually. Not only that, when you're sending that voice message, I can hear that you're really excited about talking with me. I can hear your personality coming through, not just your words. So even if you don't get it exactly right, it doesn't matter. Sending it makes you stand out from the crowd. And we are finding that people are more likely to respond if you're doing that. So give it a try. So two things we're going to check on next time. Okay. How many of you actually reached out to five connections? And how many of you tried at least one voicemail message? And again, if you want to try a voicemail message just to us, one of us, do it. It's a great way of practicing. So I put the link to our private chat. I'm going to turn off the recording now.